Hi, my name is Ravi Kane. I'm a professor of chemical and biological engineering. And today I'll be telling you about the design of nanoscale therapeutics based on the concept of polyvalency. So let's begin with some brief background on this concept. Uh, the figure on the top shows you a monovalent interaction, which involves the binding of one molecule called a ligand to another partner called a receptor forming a complex. In contrast, in a polyvalent interaction, you have the simultaneous binding of multiple ligands to multiple entities. So in the figure shown below, you have a trivalent interaction, which involves the simultaneous binding of three ligands to three receptors. Now nature makes extensive use of polyvalency, and so many molecules or entities found in nature are polyvalent. So let me give you a couple of examples. The Y-shaped molecule shown in this figure is an antibody, which is a component of our immune system. And this antibody contains two arms, which are antigen binding domains, which would bind to pathogens such as viruses. The next figure shows you a virus, which is itself polyvalent. So the spikes that you see in this figure are actually multiple viral attachment proteins. Now, a major advantage of polyvalency is that it can confer a strength or affinity that is orders of magnitude greater than that for a one-on-one -on -one monovalent interaction. And so the figure here shows you an example of a prototypical polyvalent interaction. In this case, we are looking at the attachment of a virus to its target cell. And this attachment step is often the first step in infection. Now, in this case, the step is polyvalent because it involves a simultaneous attachment of multiple viral proteins, in this case the brown stickers, to multiple receptors on our cells, in this case the yellow stickers. Now if the virus was the influenza virus, the virus that causes the common flu, then the strength of the interaction between one brown sticker and one yellow sticker would be very, very weak. And so if the flu virus had only one such brown sticker on its surface, it could never infect us very efficiently. However, through multiple simultaneous interactions, the flu virus can bind very tightly to our cells, and that's why we have to worry about the seasonal flu and more recently about bird flu. Now, we are trying to make use of this same concept found in nature to actually make drug molecules more active. And so the idea is if we design a scaffold, presenting multiple copies of an active drug molecule, such as the blue stickers in this figure, then this entire scaffold might be able to bind with high affinity to a target virus, thereby preventing the virus from attaching to a target cell, thereby preventing infection. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss our attempts to use this concept of polyvalency to design inhibitors of anthrax lethal toxin. Anthrax lethal toxin is actually responsible for symptoms and death from anthrax, which is a disease that could be caused by the inhalation of anthrax spores. The toxin itself consists of two different proteins. The protective antigen assembles into heptamers on the surface of a target cell, so the heptamer contains seven identical units. It then binds to a toxic enzyme called the lethal factor and helps carry this enzyme inside a target cell. Now we reasoned that if we could somehow find a molecule that bound to the heptamer and blocked the binding of the toxic enzyme, we could neutralize the toxin. Moreover, since the heptamer contains seven identical binding subunits, if we could somehow find a molecule that bound to one of these units, we could use this concept of polyvalency to make our molecules much, much more active. So next I'm going to discuss the molecular design approach which started with the identification of a molecule that bound to the heptamer, and the binding sites for this heptamer on the target are shaded red in the figure. Next, we reason that since the heptamer has seven-fold symmetry, to design a polyvalent molecule that bound to the heptamer, we could start with a core that also has seven-fold symmetry and attach seven peptides to the core via linkers. And then if we designed the linker length to be just right, the molecule could fit snugly against its target, and we would have a very high affinity interaction. As a core with seven-fold symmetry, we chose a molecule called beta-cyclodextrin, and as the linker, we chose a biocompatible molecule called polyethylene glycol. And indeed, when we got the linker length just right, our polyvalent inhibitor 
was more than 10,000 fold more potent than just the free peptide. And so the interesting development here is that the molecule is not just seven times more potent, but actually four orders of magnitude more active. We have gone on to design such inhibitors based on a variety of other scaffolds, and I'm going to give you two more examples. The first figure shows you what's called a vesicle or a liposome. So it's a spherical shell enclosing water, and we are decorating the outer surface of this shell with multiple copies of a peptide. And what we have found is that by tuning the density of peptides on the outer surface, we can once again increase the activity of the peptide by several orders of magnitude. The next cartoon shows you a linear polymer as the scaffold. So think of it as a strand of spaghetti decorated with multiple copies of the same peptide. And once again, by tuning the density of peptide or the number of peptides per polymer chain, we can greatly enhance the activity of our molecule. So in conclusion, what I've shown you is that polyvalency can be used to increase the activity of anthrax toxin inhibitors by many, many orders of magnitude. What's also worth noting is that these molecules work in vivo, and this is of particular relevance for treating anthrax. So the problem with anthrax today is that by the time symptoms are discovered, it's often too late to save the patient. And this is because even if one promptly administers antibiotics, there might be enough toxin that has already been secreted by the bacteria that the patient still dies. And so the hope is that the molecules of the kind that we are developing would be either by themselves or in combination with antibiotics, very useful in the late stages of the disease. Now in my labs, we are also applying the concept of polyvalency in a number of other efforts. One of them involves our attempts to increase the activity of HIV inhibitors using polyvalency. Secondly, polyvalency can not just be used to inhibit undesired interactions, but we can also use it to promote desired ones. So as an example, we are designing active polyvalent molecules that can influence stem cell differentiation. Finally, we have also been working in a new field called optogenetics, and in a recent development, we have helped develop a method that uses light to control the assembly of proteins into a polyvalent cluster, which in turn can control cellular responses. We're really excited about these research efforts. Thank you very much for listening.